right, so we're going to be talking about migrating from jQuery moving to Backbone.js. I changed the name a little bit. So uh, I'm Charles Maxwood. Um, AJ and I actually do a podcast every Tuesday about JavaScript. And there are a few other guys that, that come, so come on, sit down. So uh, anyway, I, I'm a I'm a freelance web developer. Um, I use Ruby on Rails primarily on the back end, and then you know use some of these JavaScript frameworks on the front end. Um, when I'm able to solve people's problems, it makes me feel awesome. Okay, I, I, I really really enjoy um, what the web development offers. Um, some of the podcasts that I do are Ruby Rogues. Um, it's five Ruby developers. We talk about stuff related to Ruby. JavaScript Jabber, same thing, JavaScript, and uh, the Ruby Freelancer Show is, you can come in if you want. The end or the beginning? Beginning. 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 Oh. Yeah, the fun's just starting. <laughs> so the Ruby Freelancer Show, we talk about freelancing, so if you're interested in going out on your own or you are out on your own, we talk about all kinds of stuff and finding clients to billing. Today we talked about what you should be charging your clients for and what you shouldn't. Um, so that's just some of the stuff we're doing. Alright, so how many of you have used jQuery? Where did you find those podcasts? Um, I have the links at the end of the show. But it's just the show name.com. So rubyrogues.com, javascriptjabber.com, rubyfreelancer.com. How many of you used jQuery? Yeah, everybody. So uh, some of the things that we use jQuery for, things like Ajax. Um, so sometimes we use it to manage events. I think one of the things that we're all, always happy with are the selectors. Yeah, there, there, there's a lot that jQuery gives you, a lot that it does for you that really kind of makes your life better. I mean, if you use prototype JS before, or if you were in a position where you were actually using vanilla JavaScript, heaven forbid, and trying to make that work across all the different browsers, I mean, good luck, right? And so we've got this nice thing in jQuery. Well, Backbone kind of takes things a step further. Um, it does a lot of things for you that really make it life nice. So I'm just going to list them off real fast. This isn't an introduction to Backbone. I'm really just going to be going through quickly the process that you use to um, transition from just using only jQuery on your site to using Backbone.js on your site. Um, so one is that it's a model view controller framework, kind of. Um, so it gives you a nice separation of concerns, it helps you organize your code. Um, the MVC components in Backbone don't <coughs> correspond directly with model view and controller. In Backbone, the best way I can describe it is a model is a model. The view, as you would think about it normally in model view controller, is the template. So you either have a string that has HTML in it or you're using something else like uh, Mustache or HamilJS or something. And the controller is the view in Backbone. So it's called the view and it does the controller work. Um, but it, it nicely separates that so that you can really make it modular, reuse your code, and, and get a lot out of it that way. Um, it gives you targeted events. So basically what you do is you define a view, which remember is the controller paradigm, and you say this is the element that I'm interested in, which would be your view and model view controller, and then any events that occur in there, you can, you can build those on a view by view basis. Um, views can be bound to models, which is also nice, so when the model changes, the view changes. And so if you have like a central repository, so to speak, of model objects, then it's really easy to make your view just change whenever that changes. So if you sync with the server, or you have some other interaction that change, changes something there, then it'll go up, it'll fire a change event, and then it'll trickle down to all of your views. Um, there are some JSON service uh, connection stuff that it does. So you just tell it where to go, and then it does all of the Ajax for you, which is also really, really nice. Um, and finally, it gives you collections. And collections, you can think of as uh, groups of models. And they're their own sort of class. And um, we, we don't really have classes in JavaScript, but that's kind of the closest analogy I can make. And so you create a, a collection or you retrieve a, uh, an array, a JSON array of JSON objects from a service, 
and it will build out this collection. And that gives you all kinds of nice features um, like convenient looping and you know um, MapReduce and stuff like that. So there, there's a lot there. It uses the underscore library. In, in fact, that's uh, Backbone's only um, dependency. So. so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about migrating. So when you're moving from jQuery to Backbone, well, actually I like because you don't. Um, Backbone uses jQuery and uh, you know behind the scenes to do stuff, unless you want to move over to Zepto because it also uses Zepto in the same way. And I, I guess the APIs are similar, and that allows it to, to behave that way. But anyway, so it uses jQuery to do all of the interactions that it does. So when it is finding the elements that it's interested in, it uses jQuery selectors for all the eventing. It sets up all the event stuff behind the scenes and manages all the events for you. So how do we move from just having jQuery to organizing our code into Backbone? Well, um, there are five steps. Um, they're actually in the, on the website. I put them up. That was my description. But anyway, the first thing that you do is you move your events, your jQuery events, into Backbone views. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. Then you bind the Backbone views to your models and collections. Then what you do is you initialize the models and collections necessary for initializing the page. And the reason you do this is because um, I've, I've run into issues trying to get Backbone to load the page and then in turn go back and request all of the objects that I need. And the other nice thing about that is you can just stick it into your page as part of the data, as part of the JavaScript, and it'll just serve it up. It doesn't have to go make a bunch of requests until after somebody does something to it. Um, then you move your HTML elements uh, for the views into templates. So you, you pick a templating language, or you just use a string and concatenate, which is, it can get kind of ugly depending on how much data you're sticking in there, uh, custom data. And then finally, you generate the APIs for updating and retrieving the models. So let's talk about um, events for a minute. So this is something that I took out of one of my client's code. I, uh, I shortened some of this up a little bit, but you can kind of get the picture. So uh, what you see right here is this Y link each. You know, it would be really convenient if you could just do some general, every time I click a Y link, I, you know, call this function. And there are a couple of things that, that kind of bother me with this. One is, is that you have these anonymous functions. Um, it's just, it's, it's, hard to reuse code if it's anonymous like this. It, it's much easier to keep your code dry, to keep all of the concerns that go with doing this kind of work, like clicking this particular link or whatever it is. Um, there's, a, there's a whole lot, it's a whole lot easier to do that if you actually um, move this off into its own function. And then if you need something else that does something similar, then you can just generalize it. This one down here is just showing and hiding an alert Div. And so if you check too many icons, then it will show the alert. The alert says, hey, you click too many icons. And then if not, then it'll hide them. So what we're looking for is we're looking for something maybe a little bit simpler. So here is a backbone view. So the first thing we see here is that uh, the element that it's looking for is profile icons. It has that ID. It's, it's a jQuery selector, so I mean, no mystery here, right? We've all used jQuery. We know what this looks like. We know it's going to go look up and find the first element that has that ID. And then what it does is it sets up these events, and it says, if you click a Y link, then call the Y link function. That's all it does. But it's really simple. You can see what events you're watching for. It's all in one place. It, it's neatly organized. And you know that the concerns are just with that little snippet of of HTML, just that section of your page. So then you've got the handlers. And so you get down here and you find the link that was clicked. You know, you go up to the parent, you find any hidden Ys, and the slide toggle just slides it open, slides it shut. Um, and then you can see that this is just the same as it was before. And the only reason I did this is because it was too long to go all the way across. Um, 
So let's go ahead and look at um, binding the views to the models. Because this is, this is our next step. This is our step two, right? So if something changes in the model, we need it to change in the, in the HTML. So what we do is we set up a tag name. Now this is just like the EL that we had before that was a selector. There are a whole bunch of these. There's tag name, ID, class name. And so you can, you can identify each of these. You can actually set them as functions or as strings. <coughs> And so the nice thing is, is it says I'm looking for a div, and I need it to have this ID, user underscore this model ID. And so then it'll it'll do the right thing. It'll find the right um, element. And so if we have multiple user listings on the page, then we can say whatever model you're bound to, then you need to look for that element. And so you can you can have multiple views initialized for each model. And so then, the next thing that we do is when we initialize, we say, look, this, uh, this dot model. So when you do an initialize, you can pass in a whole bunch of that E shouldn't be there, by the way. <coughs> That's my bad. Um, but you can initialize it. You can pass in a whole bunch of options. There, there are literally like 10 options you can pass. And so you can pass it a collection. You can pass it a model. You can pass it the element. You can tell it the ID, the tag name, all that stuff. Um, if you pass in, this one's expecting a model, and so it's going to look at the model, it's going to bind any change events to this dot render, and then it's going to render the, the view. And all render does is put the HTML out there. So every time the, the model changes, you can assume, for example, that the user model that's bound to this view, if the username changes, then you should see the change reflect in your page because it's going to go and it's going to re-render this. It's going to change the HTML in the element that it's, um, it's referring to. And uh, it'll put that in, it'll put this new content in there and just replace the old stuff with it. So, and, and this is another shortcut, the $EL. That, that just does the jQuery lookup for you. So it just uses the dollar function that everybody's used to with jQuery. And I'm going through these slides pretty fast. Um, all right, so determining the, the data to initialize, um, the big secret here is setting up this. So this is the example I was giving where you do the lookup. You say, okay, I want, I want to go and fetch the, the user collection and then initialize this or put content in this div. So we're assuming that this, um, this user list view is bound to the user's div. And so what it does is it says, okay, I'm setting up a new users collection, and then dot fetch actually goes out to the server, pulls the data in, sets up the models, and when it's successful, then it comes in here and it initializes a new view. So it just sets up the new view, passes in the option for users, and then when it calls a render on that view, then it'll update the contents of that div. Um, like I said, that's not the best way to go, but it is a way to go. So here's another example. Now, like I said before, I'm a Ruby on Rails developer. So um, this is ERB, which is the embedded Ruby syntax that you use when you're working with HTML. So what we do here is um, you can see that uh, that less than percent. What that does is that just embeds Ruby code. If you put in equals after it, then it'll actually just it'll render that to a string and then put it into your page. So these three lines, the top three lines in the script tag, won't actually get rendered into the page. Um, when, when the HTML is rendered, they won't show up. But, but the functionality is executed as Ruby. So you can see that on, on the first deal, if we have this instance variable, which is with the at sign in front of it, we, we do a dot math, which just uh, calls the function on it and returns a new array. So at users is an array dot map returns an array of the users converted to JSON. Now when it calls to JSON, it just sends back a string. So what we wind up with is this array of strings. Now in order to initialize the, the uh, backbone models, what we have to do is we have to pass it to the, the initializer or the new function for the user model. And so you can see that we're doing that all the way over on the, on the right. Um, where it says new user blah, it's just it's just generating another new string, and that string actually initializes the um, the model. 
And the model, if, if you give it a first argument that's an object, then what it does is it actually initializes the, the JSON model with those attributes. And since the two JSON gives us a list of attributes, that's just how it works. So the last thing that we need to do is we need to stick it together, comma, separate it, and then put it in square brackets so that we can get an array like we're used to. And so you can see here that that's what we're doing on, what is it, like line eight here where it says var users equals. On the far, uh, far right, you can see that it's actually then rendering out that string that we've built and building that out so that you get all of the models that you want to be in that collection. So it doesn't have to go do an, uh, an end run to the server. Instead, what it does is it'll, it'll take the models that have been set up in here and it'll just use those. So then when you set up the view and you pass it users, then when it builds out the template, it'll work, it'll work it out that way. And I forgot that I highlighted it. So real, real fast, um, just, to, just to go over this again. So this step converts all the, the user objects in Ruby to JSON to strings. <coughs> this step converts all those JSON strings to a string that when executed in JavaScript will render a model, a backbone model. And then in this step, it takes all of those strings that render backbone models and it strings them together, comma, uh, separated. And then here, it takes that comma separated string, it puts it into the script that's rendered when it renders out the HTML so that when the JavaScript executes, it'll set up all those models do all the work that you need it to do, and then come back with that collection that's ready to go. And then when you when you set up the view, the new view, it'll take those user objects, which are backbone models, and it'll do the work of actually building out the content that go in the div here for users. Does that make sense? I kind of went through that fast, but I want to make sure that you understand it if you didn't, so just raise your hand if you, if you need me to slow down. All right. So here's the next here's the next deal. We need to replace this. So let's say there's a whole bunch more user data. And so we're not just displaying the username anymore. We're putting an image up there. We're putting the username, email address. We want a couple of links up there that they can click on to, to update the user, send them a message or whatever, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to have to move it over. Oh, I did set those to disappear and reappear. Um, so we're going to move it over so we can actually get the stuff done that we need to do. Now, one problem we have if we're using mustache, and that's what this is. This is mustache, or handlebars, sorry. If we're using handlebars, um, our models, in order to get the attributes, you call dot .get, and then the argument is a string that's the key to the attributes object. So it doesn't really work for us because if you're, if you just did over on the far right again, you see the uh, curly brace, curly brace, if we didn't have that hash there, if it was just username, then what it would do is it would try and call a username against the user object and that, that hasn't been defined, so it would return undefined instead of calling get and then getting the the attribute. So we have two options. We can either set up the the model so that when you call username, it just accesses the attribute, or we can set up a helper. And so that's what I chose to do. So you just register a helper, call the username, you give it some func context and function. If you want to embed anything inside of tags, then then you you'll actually call the function. But in this case, we're not. We're just calling dot get username, so we don't need to use the function at all. And uh, that context is used to set up what this is, so this points to your user model. So it gets the username, so down here you can see that we, we do the curly curly hash, which is call helper, and then the content <laughs> would be what we get when we execute the function that's passed in there, but like I said, we don't need it, so we just we just say, okay, we're done. Um, we don't have any arguments for the, um, the helper. And uh, so this is exactly like what we had here. 
So you can you can see that they're pretty much the same. Go, go back again. So this string right here, the div class username, model get username, that, that is exactly what we get right here in this string for this template. Okay. So then what we do is in our view when we render the function, we just tell it, look, we need this template, so mustache. Uh, go compile this template. I think that should be handlebars. I don't know why it typed up wrong. But anyway, and then you just, uh, you, we're doing the same thing. We're just doing template model, and that model is what sets the context for the template. And so it executes the template, inserts the data from the model, passes it back as HTML, and that's how we get that into the page. So far so good? So there are a whole bunch of options for template markups. Um, mustache is what initially started using these uh, curly braces that you have here. Um, handlebars just expands on that, gives you a little more functionality there. It's written by Ikuda Katz, who wrote Ember.js. Um, I really like it. Haml.js is based on a markup language that uh, I think originated with Ruby um, and is pretty popular in the Ruby on Rails framework. Um, JST is a lot like when I showed you the ERB examples, that's what those look like with the, with the triangle braces and the percents. Um, Google's closure templates, dust.js, there are a bajillion more of them. You know, whatever, whatever works, you can call whatever you want because all you're really doing is this kind of substitution in your DOM. So let's talk about JSON APIs, because that's our last step, right? Set up these APIs so that we can get the data back that we want. So I've seen a couple of different <laughs> formats for objects. The first one, you tell it what kind of object it is. And uh, the second one, you just pass the attributes back and you expect the front end to know what to do with it. Um, Backbone prefers the second. Um, Ruby on Rails defaults to the first. So there's an option you can pass in that says don't don't include the first level, and that's fine. If you're so doing a rate. I was, I was just going to say, in your API, wouldn't your REST interface be something like slash user anyway? So it kind of yeah. obviates the need for putting it in the JSON? Yeah, and in fact, um, we're, we're going to get to that in a future slide, but uh, the backbone models and collections, you actually define what the path is for them to go get what they're getting. So when it makes the request, it it already knows, because the model is what's doing it, the model is what defines the class. The collection knows what models go in it, so it knows it knows what to build with the attributes it's getting back. Um, arrays, you know, pretty straightforward there. So, if we're, if we're doing requests to get these, I'm, I'm going to have a ton of time at the end, so if you have questions, be ready. Um, so if you have, um, so if you're going to make a request, let's say you want to, you create a new model in Backbone, and you want to persist it to your server. If you're doing that, you do it through a post. And if it's an existing model, then what you do is you, you do it through a put, an HTTP put. Um, the URL root is what tells it where to go. So if it's, if it's a new model, or if you're getting a, a collection or things like that, then usually it's just slash URL root, um, and that's it. But if it's an existing model, then it'll tack the model ID on the end. So here's an example of a model. And you can see that we have the URL root right here. It's slash users. So then if we have this user, that uh, has an ID of 10, then if we want to know what URL it's going to hit when it tries to persist it or sync it up, then we can see that it's slash users slash 10. Um, if we're creating a new one that doesn't have an ID, it knows it's, it's not been persisted, it's not been synced, then if you call user.save, then it posts here and it sends that data. So if it posts to slash users, and it sends name, chat, language, English. And then if you if you do a user.fetch and it has the ID, then it knows that 
this is the path it needs to go to. So it does a, just a normal get request and it'll get a JSON object back. And I realize this is at the bottom of the slide and probably hard to see from the back, I'm sorry. So if you're building the API from the other end, I'm sticking with what I know. So you have the user class in Ruby, in Ruby on Rails. Ruby on Rails is also a model view controller. So this is a model. And um, after accessible just says that uh, the name and the language can be mass assigned by um, a model call. And we'll see that in a second. Um, to JSON is on there by default. But if you overwrite it in Ruby, you can call super and pass it whatever options you want. So <coughs> these options, what it's doing is it's saying, <coughs> um, take any options you get here and overwrite them or overwrite these options with anything you get here. Otherwise, it'll just default to that. And then, in the routes, all you have to do is set up resources, and resources does the RESTful routing that Backbone expects by default. So that's actually something that's really, really convenient. So then you have the, the controller. So the way that Rails works really quickly is your request comes in, it hits a dispatcher, the dispatcher uses these routes right here to, uh, to determine which controller and which action to send to based on the HTTP request type, so put, post, get, delete, um, and the path. And so, like I said, this, this lines it up really nicely for, um, for our APIs. So when you do a get to slash users, this is what it's hitting, it's hitting index. So it goes out and it gets all the users and it renders a JSON representation of those. Um, if you do a get with an ID, and that's slash ID, and it knows that that's the route that it's expecting, the path, um, then it'll take, it'll find the one user with that ID on it, and then it'll render it to JSON. So this is pretty simple. Um, post goes to create, so Params is just the parameters that are passed in. So that, that parameter string that we had right here, it, it'll just parse that, it'll pick it apart, and it'll, it'll get back a hash or a dictionary, or if you're familiar with JavaScript, an object is kind of the same thing. And so, um, so it'll, it'll have a key of name and a value of Chuck, key of language, value of it, English. It'll pass those in and it knows to create those Put, put them in the database, do all the persistence for you, and then it'll render the, the user back. And so that, that provides Backbone with the ability to then use it as not just a save, but a sync. And so it can synchronize with, um, with your service. So then with update, um, it's the same thing, except you do a put, and this is the mass assignment right here, this update attributes. And uh, it, the, the exclamation point on the end you don't need, but what it does is it causes it to error. It, it actually throws an exception if there's a problem saving, as opposed to if, if it's not there, then it'll just return false is the difference. So, so then it'll return a 500 error if you gave back gave it bad data or something. So anyway, so it finds the user, updates it with all the parameters that were sent in, and then it renders the user to JSON. And so, I gave my one hour talk in half the time. So if you have any questions about Backbone, let me know. I just have a question on the persistence letter. I don't know if I missed this, but let's say I have an API that's already defined, and maybe it doesn't follow that schematic post, post it's not RESTful. Mm -hmm. is, it, is the Backbone easy to extend that persistence layer? Like, can I adjust it to my need? Yeah, so um, let me roll back to right here. So where I have URL root right here, yeah, you can actually set the URL the same way. Oh, okay. And so you can either set the, the, um, can I tell the property. It, can I tell it to do maybe a, a post or an update as well, not just, does that make sense? Like I'm going with an API that only allows posts, so it's not really restful, it's just right. an API. So, uh, Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, you don't really find the way it's 
sync to the server. Yeah. It's just a function in backbone that dot sync. Okay. And you can you know I like can override that sync function. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can override just about any property of the Yeah, that's the cool thing of backbone that's awesome. Okay. Okay. And, it, and if push came to shove, I mean, you could even just define another function in here that does the syncing for you, and then instead of causing, calling save, you call my save or whatever, and just do it that way. Okay. But you'd have to set up the Ajax yourself, so the dollar Ajax, URL, type, data, all that stuff. Any other questions? AJ? So, uh, since we've got a little bit of time, could you do a little live coding and... and Put up something that uh, fidgets <laughs> with backbone. Are you up for that or? Oh, uh, probably. No pressure. No pressure. I don't use this machine for my primary coding, so. So what? Just really briefly, what made you choose backbone over the other frameworks? Like what? What? So, um, to be honest, I'm not completely sold that this is the best framework for every situation. Um, it was simple. It was really easy to figure out how to use it. And that was something that I really, I really appreciated about it. And um, i had been fighting trying to organize my jQuery code for so long, find a system that really worked for me, and this really just... It, everything just kind of fell into place. And I was able to convert one of my client's applications to uh, Backbone within a matter of like a week. And uh, it cleared up a lot of stuff. On, on another client's app, I actually did this, started playing with the templates, and it, it sped up some of the interactions and stuff, because they had a lot of like, you would hover over a, a div and it would pop out um, information on the right side. and uh, it was really slow because it was doing AJAX requests for all that and you know had to render all the HTML and what have you and so instead I could either store a JSON string or um, just uh, actually have it pre-rendered in my uh, application and so as soon as I hovered or clicked it just popped right out and so it made it really easy and that's one of the things I didn't talk about with the templates is if you pre-render them you can pre-compile them then they're really fast because it doesn't have to do anything extra with it. It already knows um, all I need is a model to stick in here and I'm done. You know, boom, I've got HTML for all of that. And the, the other nice thing that I also left out was that if you're rendering a view on a collection, what you can do is you can actually then uh, initialize views on all of the members of the collection. And so you have all of the events for the collection at large in a larger div, and then you can embed the views inside for each each element. So if you have a list of users, or if you're doing a Twitter clone, you have a list of uh, Twitter posts or tweets, then you know you can do that same thing. And so your your collection view, where you can filter them maybe or something like that, like all of those features would be on the collection view. So you click that, and then it does you know a few little jQuery tricks to hide the wrong ones and show the right ones. And then, um, and then if you click on like retweet or something, then that's all handled by the individual tweets view. And so it, it separates that really nicely too. And the way that it works is it doesn't actually, from what I understand, when you click on something, it actually catches it when it bubbles up. It doesn't actually set an actual event on each of those elements. So um, it just watches it when it bubbles up and then says, okay, where did it originate? And do I care about anything in between? And so it's kind of a different paradigm there, but um, my understanding is, is that that helps with some of the coupling and binding problems that you might run into if you have too many events watching too many things. So. Um, I mean, you kind of touched on a little bit there, but what would be some examples that uh, you found back when maybe not necessarily the best solution to? Um, so most of the apps that I build are pretty small, and so it works really well for those. Um, I haven't really run into anywhere where I haven't wanted to use it, but um, I've, I've heard of other people that have run into instances where, you know, maybe they just wound up with, you know, they're, they're managing a lot of other stuff and there are other frameworks that do a little bit more for you. For example, em, Ember.js 
and I, I talk to Yehuda off and on. Um, but anyway, that is more like rails, and so it's a little heavier weight, and so what it does, it does a lot more for you. It, it actually does the data binding automatically for you. Um, and so if you're setting up a lot of objects that need to bind to a lot of DOM elements, then, then you might want to look at that instead. Um, it really just comes down to what the strengths and weaknesses are and where, where you may want to roll something yourself versus having it do it for you. And uh, Ember is actually very convention over configuration, mm -hmm. and so which, which is what Rails is, and that's not a surprise because Yehuda is on the Rails core team as well. Um, but uh, anyway, so it just it just assumes a lot of things for you. And so if you just want something that does things and you're willing to do it the way that that thing wants you to do it, then, then Ember's a good way to go. If you're, if you're more, I, I want to get in, I want to know what all the code's doing, I want to know what I'm up against here, um, I want to fight some of these battles myself and solve it my way, then you probably want to go with Backbone. But some applications get so complicated that it's not worth fighting those battles. And so you just pick the couple that do matter and tell Ember to do something different. So, at least that's how I see it. <laughs> Somebody may have a different opinion. But, um, I, I think a lot of these, it really just depends on the paradigm for your problem and you know what the best way to solve it is. And so, I mean, you may find that Knockout JS or Angular JS is a better go for you. And it just depends on which way you want to uh, attack the problem, how you want to slice and dice it. In your illustrations, you showed a lot of you know, JavaScript and HTML together, which is great for illustration. But, uh, how would you normally um, separate out and have your, your handlebars templates? What are kind of the options you have for <coughs> keeping those separate? So, um, if you go look at the handlebars documentation, and I'm not on the wireless, so I would go look at it, but I'm not going to. Um, if, if you dig around a little bit, you can see how to just embed them in your page. The problem is, is then you have to compile them and then, um, and then you know, use them template and then pass the model in. So in a lot of cases, what people do is they'll actually uh, store it as a like .js file in their in their system, and then as part of the compilation step, which a lot of people are doing now anyway, just to save on. Um, HTTP requests and bandwidth, because what, what they do is they say, okay, all of my JavaScript assets, I'm going to stack them all up into one file, I'm going to minify the thing, and then I'm going to send it back. So you can serve bandwidth and you also wind up um, <coughs> saving requests because you don't make six requests to get six JavaScript files. And so what they do as part of that process is they actually pre-compile the mustache stuff. So you, you have them in your in your source code as just individual view files or individual template files, however you want to think about them. And then, yeah, you just you just compile them in there real fast because you're, all you're doing is sticking those objects in and making them go. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, so um, one of the things that, uh, this was built by Document Cloud. They also built underscore, incidentally. It's probably not an accident. Um, and then they also built a, a utility called Jamit, and Jamit is written in Java, I believe, and it does the pre-compilation for you. So you can set, you can actually just set up a command line call from your, um, from your stack. And so when you do your deployments, um, and I'm trying to be general here, in, in Rails, we use a tool called Capistrano, and so all I would do is I would just set a task in there before it goes up to the server, and I would say compile all my assets, commit them to the repository, and then as part of the deploy on the other end, it would pull it out of the repository, and since it's pre-compiled now in the repository, it would pull it down on the server and just be ready to go. So then it didn't have to do anything. So then your pre-compiling happens on the fly, it's always, uh, so the source is actually pre-compiled, is what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, the, the other thing you can do is, there are watcher programs that you can get, um, depending on what your your infrastructure is. The one I use is, again, another Ruby utility. It's called Guard. They also have one called Watcher. Um, I'm sure like every language has like three or four of them. But, uh, you know, it's just a command line utility. And you say, watch this directory, watch these types of files. When they change, then do your work. And so you can do the same thing there. You just set it up and say, 
watch all the JS files or mustache files or whatever extension you've given it um, in your views folder and then you just tell it if any of them change then pre-compile and you know, save it so then the next time you commit before you deploy then it's already done. And there are a lot of solutions to this but uh, it, it does, it solves, it solves that problem for you and I found that it's just, it's, it's really, really nice to uh, be able to do that and uh, you know, depending on how ambitious you are then on the other end what you can do is you can use your pre-compiled templates to um, basically preload certain uh, HTML elements and then when you need them you just pull them out as opposed to uh, rendering them every time but I haven't seen a real big savings there. Most of the savings comes in with pre-compiling your stuff. <coughs> Sorry. One thing is that uh, for the templates uh -huh. uh, you can also just put it on your HTML yes. uh, as a script uh, with a different type uh -huh. and an ID and then yes. on your uh, background views, you just define the ID of that uh, element, mm -hmm. and background will automatically load it. And yeah, in your render method, you just call uh, whatever uh, library you are using to expand that template into a real, right. a real thing. Mm -hmm. And then you can have it separate your controller uh, view, or to call it somehow, mm -hmm. from your template, which yeah, is so still in your HTML. So what he's saying, you know, let me, I forget if you can't see the slideshow, I'm going to do this. So what he's saying is right, right here, right. What, what I've done is I've put this into this string, I've just stored it under templates, right? Hmm. So what he's saying instead is you have a script, ta a script tag in your HTML, and you give it like uh, type x, slash the yeah. application handlebars or handle, yeah, that would work. And then you have this kind of stuff in that div tag or in that script tag. And so then what you do is you come down here and when you do must or mustache handlebars.compile, you just do a jQuery selector. And since you put an ID on the script tag, you can do a selector to find it. And when you call dot HTML with no arguments, this has an argument so it replaces the HTML tell it with no arguments, you get the HTML that's stored in that script tag, and, and it just gives you back a string yeah. like this, and so you do the same thing, and so <coughs> what, what he's saying is you can just put them in line, and so then you can load them in as part of, um, if you have like partial views as you render your normal HTML, then you can just load the ones in that you need as part of those partial views. So you would effectively load, um, so you would load this, and then you have the script tag that has your yeah. And then you would have this other script tag that does all the work to set it up. Any other questions? Comments? We have about 15 minutes trying to do a live code thing. Oh, by the way, one other thing that I do want to point out. Um, Real quick, this is totally self-promotion. I am a freelancer. You can hire me. I appreciate you hiring me. This is my cell number. That's my email address. Either of those will get to me. And then if you want to see any of the other stuff I've done, I've got uh, video tutorials. I haven't done any in a while. I need to because I need to get all this uh, backbone stuff in there at teachmetocode.com. Um, and I also interview just interesting people doing interesting stuff with code at teachmetocode.com. And then, like I said, rubyrogues.com is a panel discussion about Ruby and programming. Um, it seems like we've gotten away a little bit from Ruby-specific stuff, so we talked a lot about agile development. We've talked about um, being good citizens in the code community, um, experimentation with your coding style, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, JavaScript Jabber, we've been a little more JavaScript-centric, which I don't think is a bad thing, but we... Uh, the, the JavaScript community has gone from this language that everybody hated to use in their browser to something that people are using on the server and on the browser and to do all kinds of things that nobody ever thought you would ever do with JavaScript or even want to. And so it's, it's just become this interesting ecosystem. So we've been bringing people in and talking to them about all the different things in there. So if you want to hear Yehuda and Jeremy Ashkenes who wrote Backbone, those of Backbone versus Ember, yeah, they, 
they had it up about a half hour on the show. <laughs> um, and then Ruby Freelancer. So yeah, if you're looking to go freelance or anything like that, um, you can listen to me and three other guys uh, that have been doing freelance a lot longer than I have. Talk about freelancing. If you if you want to get a hold of me because you have questions about going freelance, I'm, I'm happy to answer those too and, and help you kind of get on your way that way. Um, if you want to learn Ruby on Rails, another one I have up that I don't have up here is railscoach.com. And so uh, you can go and you can start picking up some of the Ruby on Rails stuff. As you can see, it works real well with Backbone. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of cover the basics of Ruby on Rails. Um, I'm actually starting over. So I'm going to be starting kind of from the beginning or the basics and moving my way up um, and covering more advanced topics. And then I'm going to be building videos that go along with the audio discussion so that uh, you can listen to the audio, kind of get an idea what the principles are, and then you can watch the video and kind of get an idea what, what's going on there. So anyway, um, if you want to find me, these are all great ways to do it. And, uh, you know, I like meeting people. I like getting feedback. So if you have any, any thoughts or anything like that on this presentation or on any of these shows, just let me know. Anyway. So... Where we can get here in, uh, in 15 minutes or less. What should we call this? To do? To make a to do app? Another one? Because there are a million of them out there. Okay. And you're not mirroring that screen. Switch for Ruby versions. Rails new to do. Is there a way to touch it on the screen? Ah, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> You're really amazing, but you won't show us anything. So. <laughs> I just I just generated a new rail map. That's all it takes. Yeah. Oh, problem. I don't have. I'm not on the wireless, and I don't have the backbone libraries on here. That doesn't have wireless. I just haven't signed into it. It, it takes 30 seconds. Might be too long. So CTC and one two three OS.
underscore. Oh, that's true. I do need an underscore, don't I? say about newer versions and well oh, remove A and B. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's like the other. What was that? That's the, when they made that change, that was really, really bad. I used required yes uh -huh. and that destroyed all my price when I was there with that. Because I need to define you know in the uh -huh. separate mode to so what there's a branch on GitHub that still uses it. Yeah. Yeah, but it's not in yeah. the main service. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Are are they still reflecting changes back over time? I thought they were. Is yeah, I thought the whole thing with required JS was just like two line header, two line footer. Right. I don't know why they removed it, but yeah, that's it. <laughs> I'm using a Rob yes. This is one of the things I love about development. Everybody has an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. JavaScript has the unfortunate uh, situation of having like three benevolent dictators instead of one. <laughs> <laughs> you got Isaac Schuler, Douglas Crockford, and Brendan Eich. Eh, I don't think he really plays much of a role. Seems like there's somebody else. Well, then you got like like the Rails guys. Like the Rails Yehuda. Guys. Yehuda is probably one of those you know people up, up there. I don't know. Because uh, you either, either like and use this stuff or you don't. We should talk about semicolons. Yeah. <laughs> Com first. Always. I don't think I've ever written a line in JavaScript that was com first. Doesn't make you a bad person. It's never too late to repent. <laughs> <laughs> Done uh, installing all of my Ruby libraries. It'll be time to go. You could walk us through some of the stuff on backbonejs.org. Yeah, I could. There's some stuff I love that I could go through. And Backbone has a mocking interface too, doesn't it? Where you can like define what a route should give you without actually having the server on the other end? Um, I haven't done anything like that, so I don't know. Okay. I am fully willing to not speculate if I had, don't have an answer, so... Okay, so... Um, I showed you the events. That's something that I really love. Um, fetch is, is just something that's really nice, and it's it uses the same kind of thing that you're used to with the Ajax request with uh, with jQuery. So it has success and an error uh, attribute or options in the option hash. And so you know you can you can do a whole lot with that. Um, and the save slash sync is, is really nice. I really like that as well. Um, one thing I didn't go over that's that's really cool with this is that it does validations. <coughs> So you can use your model to validate the attributes that you have for your model and say, you know, it is or it isn't valid. So you just set your validations in here and then you tell it when it fails and then you can check the validations with is valid. So here's the URL that we were talking about here. So if you wanted to set a custom URL, you can. Um, I don't see a way to change the request type. You know, post versus put. Yeah, no, for that you need to customize the sync, the backbone.sync method. 
Okay. There is no easy way to do it. You need to redo okay. the entire so library. Like, uh, like on right. the yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sadly. Yeah. So with collections, it's it's pretty uh, straightforward. It's the same kind of thing. You do have to specify the model. So you just say model, and then you tell it which backbone model you're using. And then when you make the request, then it just initializes all those for you. Um, you but you get all this nice stuff, you know, push, pop, shift, unshift. And then um, if you're not familiar with underscore, you get for each map, reduce, reduce right, find, filter, reject, every sum. You know, so you get all of these nice things. So reject, what it does is it, it goes through and it, uh, it kicks out all of the numbers that don't match, whatever your uh, function returns. So if your function returns true, you can't see it. So if, if the modulus you know, is equal to zero, then, uh, then it kicks it out. <coughs> and I think it has a select method too. It might be pluck. But all any include. So you can see it. You can see if a particular object is in there, is in the collection. Sort by, so you can, you can sort by whatever, group by, so you, you know, you group it by math, dot four num, so then if it's one dot something or two dot something. Anyway, a lot of, a lot of handy things there. So routers is something I didn't talk about. And uh, basically, the way that the routers work is, let me see if I can find an example here. So you have these routes, and uh, so this first string here, like help, what that is is if you have hash help, or if you see, you can actually see up here, hash router, but that's actually going to uh, uh, an anchor tag with the ID. It's going to that ID. But uh, anyway, um, if you have hash and then whatever you want your path to be. In fact, if you go, Twitter used to do this, I don't know if they still do, but you used to see it was like hash bang slash username or whatever. What they're doing is they're doing this exact kind of thing. And so it, it's, not, it's not a path that's hash bang, it's actually a hashtag at the end of the URL. And then they parse that out using something like this and uh, so you can see here, like search colon query. The, the neat thing is, is so if you do hash search slash Chuck, or their example is hash search slash Kiwis, then it will do whatever is in this search function, and it'll pick up the query as the first argument. You know, and you have this where you get the page, so P7. So what would happen in this case is if you went to the, the current page and then you had this at the end, hash search slash kiwis slash p7, then it would come down here and would call this search and it would pass in kiwis for the query and seven for the page. And the nice thing is, is then what you can do, in fact, what most of the time you see done here is it will actually go ahead and it'll find any models it needs it will do the fetch. If it's a success, then it will initialize the view and build the HTML for you. And, and it's just, it's really, really neat. Um, the constructors are another thing that are really nice. Um, you can see here that it just, this one just takes options, but on your, um, on your collection, you have all of these different So you pass in the models, and then you can give it options, and that options are, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't specify, they're probably the same as the model which is specified here. I know it's listed here somewhere. Anyway, so you can pass in all those options to get the URL and everything lined up and working properly. Um, but the views, I think, are really the powerful thing. Because even if you don't use anything else, you can use that to manage all of your DOM manipulation and uh, just really make a rich and powerful UI. Anyway, it looks like I'm out of time, so I'm going to...